150 years ago, the king of France had this obelisk brought from Egypt to grace the heart of Paris. 3,000 years earlier, it had been dedicated to the great pharaoh Ramses II with these words, so long as heaven exists, your monument shall exist, and your name shall endure like the heaven. Through the 30 centuries that the pharaohs ruled Egypt, the people of the Nile created the most glorious monuments the world has ever seen. Among them, the largest place of worship in the ancient world. These miracles in stone were tributes to their gods and kings. They believed that man, like the sun, could die and be reborn. They constructed elaborate tombs to protect the body and house the soul throughout eternity. They created guides to the underworld, books of the dead to ensure immortality. And on their monuments, they left the testimony of their faith. These inscriptions are keys with which we unlock the secrets of ancient Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are in the temple of the Queen Hatshepsut. The and as they have since the days of Herodotus, Anthony and Cleopatra, thousands journey here to see these wonders. Going down to the Green Valley for the holy visit of Amun-Ra to the goddess Hatur once a year for 15 days. But today, having endured for 50 centuries, these seemingly imperishable structures are threatened. Their fate may be determined in our lifetime. So, people of science, soul and conscience travel here from all over the globe to save the priceless monuments, to decipher the meaning of the messages before they disappear forever. This is the story of the land of Egypt and the quest for eternity. The Nile, flowing through the endless miles of Egypt's desert sands, its precious waters gave birth and breath to one of the greatest civilizations that has ever taken hold on our planet. Hail to you, O Nile, went an ancient hymn. Sprung from earth, come to nourish Egypt. Food provider, bounty maker, who creates all that is good. The river's annual flooding left rich deposits of silt. Utilizing it, farmers developed a settled life. Sustained by its abundant waters, the land and crops prospered. clay pots to the bricks with which they built their homes. The Nile itself was Egypt's highway. Boats sailed northward with the currents and south with the prevailing wind. To predict the time when the river would overflow, the ancients developed a calendar, our own evolved from it. Along the extended oasis of the Nile Valley, a way of life emerged that still endures today, virtually unchanged from the furthest reaches of recorded time.
And in the time of the Nile's annual flooding, when the farmers could not till their fields, they built the pyramids, tombs for their pharaohs. All that remains of the seven wonders of the ancient world, they were stairways to heaven, for to all Egyptians, their religion promised an afterlife. The largest monument ever constructed, the Great Pyramid, contains more than two million immense limestone blocks, each weighing over two tons. One hundred thousand men toiled for twenty years without wheel, horse, or iron tools to create it, that their pharaoh might join the sun god and live in eternity. This dedication to gods and kings was to sustain the Egypt of the pharaohs for 3,000 years. From the beginning, the Nile was the soul of the land. The lotus growing on the riverbanks symbolized the people of Upper Egypt. The papyrus, shimmering in the marshes of the delta, was the symbol of Lower Egypt. Immortalized on this tablet of slate, a king known as Narmer wears the high domed crown of Upper Egypt on one side, the low curled crown of Lower Egypt on the other. It commemorates his unification of the two lands to create the nation of Egypt in 3100 BC. From that time, Egyptian kings would wear both crowns as rulers of the two kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. The two lands have remained linked from Narmer's time to the present. Isolated from its neighbors, protected by mountains, desert, and sea, the Nile Valley was an ideal crucible in which a civilization could begin. Traces of those beginnings can be found in the city of Nechen, The site, still populated today, holds evidence of habitation stretching back 6,000 years. Since 1967, Dr. Walter Fairservice of Vassar College and the American Museum of Natural History has been excavating here in his continuing search for the roots of civilization. It was here, just 90 years ago, that the Narmer tablet was discovered. It was here, 50 centuries before, that King Narmer established the capital of the newly unified nation. Here we have the walls of a princely complex that uh, belonged to a king who lived here 5,000 years ago, at the very beginning of Egypt's unification. Uh, he was a great king, a powerful monarch. And we know from the size of the rooms and the way things are located that he was a very rich man, a very wealthy person. We know he has storerooms full of grain. We know that he, he had perhaps a great hoard of copper and many other things of that order. And yet, uh, oddly enough, this powerful monarch, he uh, left the place. He abandoned it. And that's part of the reason we're exploring this area, to uh, find out why. Why at the very beginnings of Egypt's history do we have a, a, a place as important as this abandoned? Perhaps the secret still lies buried in these mud brick walls. <laughs> Sifting through the debris of the centuries, the fair service team continues to piece together the history of the site. Many threads bind Egyptian prehistory history and history, but none is stronger than the belief in immortality. But this one is interesting. Equipped with objects necessary for the afterlife, 
These bodies were buried before the first pharaoh built his palace here. Right here, if I can pull this up just a little bit, hairpins found at the roof of the skull. Um, made of, of some quill-like, or ivory, I guess. Perhaps it's ivory. Perhaps <laughs> ivory, yeah. Put that back there. In this temple dome, religion, tradition, and political power fused. Foundations were laid on which the longest lasting of all ancient civilizations would rise. Two thousand years later, Egypt's religious capital was Thebes, one of the richest, most powerful cities on earth. At its heart was the temple of Amun at Karnak, the largest place of worship in the ancient world. As dynasty followed dynasty, the great complex was enlarged and embellished by a succession of pharaohs. Tutankhamun, whose fabulous tomb treasures dazzled the world. A female pharaoh, Hatshepsut, called the first great woman in history. The heretic Akhenaten, first believer in one god and Ramses II, the greatest builder of all time. Called Ramses the Great, Pharaoh, while Egypt's power and prosperity flourished, this warrior king was to rule for 67 years, bring peace to the empire, father nearly 200 children, and leave his mark on fully half the monuments in Egypt. Ramses was only about 20 when his father, Seti I, died in 1290 BC. Seti had ordered his funerary temple built at Abydos. One of Ramses' first acts as pharaoh was to travel there to complete it. To all Egyptians, this was the most sacred city on earth. Here, drawn by some mystical identification with Abydos and the long dead pharaoh, an extraordinary woman known as Om Seti was to come 3,000 years later. With a group of fellow Egyptologists, she celebrates her 77th happy birthday. birthday to you. Happy birthday, Om Seti. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Well, thank you very much. I'm mean, exactly You right. certainly made it a happy birthday. Let's make a speech. <laughs> Make a speech. I am. I afraid it was a mass produced one, but. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, that won't matter. <laughs> my heart, my mother, my heart, my mother, my heart, whereby I came into being. Do not stand up and witness against me at the judgment. I think that's the text. Mm -hmm. should you be. got it. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. To Umseti at her 77th on her way to 110. <laughs> Thank you. Let us drink to our dear old friend Ramses II. <laughs> Born Dorothy Eady in England, she says something called her here from the time she was a child. She came here 50 years ago, married an Egyptian, and had a son whom she named Seti. From then on, she was known as Um Seti, which means mother of Seti. She has devoted the last 30 years of her life to the study of Seti I's temple and become an expert on him and Ramses II. Ramses tells that he came to Abydos alone, you see, in the first year of his reign after his father was dead, and he found that the decoration of this temple was incomplete. In the inscription, he says that I ordered the work of my father to be completed. And all the works which my father had started and were still incomplete, I had them finished. And then he goes on as if he's speaking to the soul of his father, you see, and telling him that all that Seti had wanted to do and died before completing, and all his plans and ambitions, Ramses would complete it. 
And he said, so long as I am ruling, it will be as though you are still on the throne. He was a nice fellow, and he was a very good son. When Um Seti came here for the Egyptian Department of Antiquities, the temple was in ruins. Its reconstruction became her passion. They confronted me with a pile of fragments of inscribed stone. There were over 2,000. Some were very small, some were very big. My job was to copy the inscriptions on them, catalog them, and where possible, you know, fit them together. The temple is vibrant with carvings that look as fresh today as when they were painted 3,000 years ago. Its walls tell the first known story of resurrection. Osiris, a mythical ruler, was killed and dismembered by his brother. His wife, the goddess Isis, found the scattered pieces of his body, bound them together, and Osiris arose from the dead. Their son, the falcon-headed god Horus, was to grow to manhood and avenge his father. Anubis, jackal-headed god of embalming, was sent by the sun god to help Osiris live eternally. The Egyptians believed that because Osiris died and rose again, they too could achieve immortality. Worshipping Osiris, Seti assures his place in the afterlife. Offering incense, the pharaoh worships before the bark of the sun god, Amun Re. Just as Seti offers bread, ducks, figs, and a pomegranate to Isis. Um Seti follows the ancient beliefs. Oh yes, every year at the great feast, and again on the birthday of the gods Osiris and Isis, I come here with offerings of wine, bread and incense. Oh, I love coming here. You know, it's a place I really do feel at home. Three days after this filming was completed, Om Seti died. She was buried in Abydos, Egyptian city of resurrection. In the time of Ramses, the most powerful deity of the living was the sun god, Amun Re. He was patron of the city of Thebes, located on the Nile between the first capital, Nekem, and Abydos. On the east bank, where the sun rises, were temples dedicated to the sun god, Karnak and Luxor. On the west bank, where the sun buries itself each day, was a complex of tombs where royalty was buried. The Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. The Greek poet Homer was to immortalize Thebes as the city of a hundred gates, where four hundred heroes with their horses and chariots pass through each of these Greek gates. While Ramses reigned, Thebes was splendid. He ordered beautiful additions made to Luxor Temple. Gigantic statues, obelisks, and courts dedicated to the glory of Amun Re. But having endured 3,000 years, these monuments face destruction in our time from the effects of increased agriculture, industrialization, changing weather conditions, due in part to the Aswan High Dam, and even the tourists themselves. In 
In 1924, in response to the impending crisis, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago established a permanent headquarters in Egypt. Called Chicago House, it was founded by Dr. James Henry Breasted, father of American Egyptology, who envisioned making a record of all the endangered monuments of ancient Egypt. Today, Chicago House is under the direction of Dr. Lanny Bell. The scholars of Chicago House have undertaken a monumental labor called the Epigraphic Survey. Over the past 50 years, the Oriental Institute has published an epic series of volumes containing the results of the survey. Utilizing an ingenious combination of photography and draftsmanship, the Chicago House Egyptologists create facsimile drawings of the monument's carved and painted surfaces, the only record that will remain when the hieroglyphs and decorations have disappeared forever from the temples. As Pharaoh succeeded Pharaoh, it was common practice for him to alter temples, taking credit for the work of their predecessors. By interpreting successive decorations, the Chicago House team is decoding the history of Luxor Temple. As the glory of Pharaonic Egypt faded, People built houses inside the temple. Their debris buried much of it for 2,000 years. When excavation started 100 years ago, the stone walls were suddenly exposed to the air. Since then, salts leaching out of the stone combine with moisture in the air, creating crystals that slough off, taking the images with them. The salt on the walls makes our work urgent. The reliefs are being dissolved so that within a period of 200 years, the temple will still stand, but all of the decorated surface will have flaked off. When they are gone, we want there to be a record as accurate as humanly possible of the decoration so that scholars will be able to consult our drawings and be sure that the reliability is such that any questions they have about the decoration will be answered in our volumes. The gods were worshipped here no more. Great portions of the temple were dismantled. Large blocks were broken into smaller pieces for reuse as building material. Thousands of them have been collected over a 30-year period. Chicago House is conducting a systematic search of the fragments to reconstruct a section called the Lost Colonnade. fragment that may fit, artist Ray Johnson makes notations and the block is carefully photographed. pencils, then inks in the lines of the photograph, making corrections and replacing what time may have removed. Then the artist fits the photograph into his rendering of the wall. Only the areas within the ink lines have actually been found, but from the salvage fragments it is sometimes possible to reconstruct the entire design created by the original artist 3,000 years ago. You support me going up. <laughs> on those exciting and rare occasions, when a fragment that fits onto a standing wall is found, it is replaced. Toward the left. Toward me? To the left. So, 
piece by piece, the ancient temple of Amun Re rises again. The investigations of Chicago House have revealed that the colonnade of Luxor Temple is the major standing monument of Tutankhamun. To completely evaluate its architectural history, the inscriptions at the top of the structure must be photographed. Ladders reaching five stories high have been assembled. This is the first time in 50 years that anyone has attempted the ascent. In the 70-foot high columns, Dr. Bell studies the techniques used by the artisans of antiquity. Here they inserted wooden blocks to stabilize the structure as they fitted it together. A roof once covered the colonnade, but it fell or was removed sometime before 1600 AD. Fragments of it found on the temple floor have been identified. Assessing the temple's past, Dr. Bell's thoughts inevitably turn to its future. Paradoxically, the vibrations caused by the endless footsteps of the tourists who visit each year, even the carbon dioxide they exhale, are eroding the irreplaceable treasures they come to enjoy. Chicago House studies have revealed that a hundred years after Tutankhamun built this structure, Ramses II systematically erased his predecessor's name and replaced it with his own, naively assuming he could deceive the gods and take credit for the colonnade's construction. This also added to the majesty of Luxor Temple. He built a massive entrance, the horizon from which the sun god goes forth. From reliefs, we can reconstruct a dazzling annual festival, the Feast of Opet. With the Nile in full flood, the golden statue of the god Amun Re has been brought to Luxor from Karnak in his boat shrine. Within the temple's innermost sanctuary, Ramses offers incense, flowers, and food to the linen shrouded god. The sacrifices and ceremonies concluded, priests lead the procession out of the temple, purifying the way before them. Thousands of citizens crowd the waterfront to see musicians, Nubian dancers, soldiers, and priestesses accompany the procession along the Nile. The shrine of the god is placed on its sacred bark, and in great ceremony, priests, god, and pharaoh are towed back to Connect Temple. Ramses' favorite queen, Nefertari, and the royal princesses greet the procession as it arrives. Concluding nearly a month of worship and revelry, the royal couple enters the great temple of Amun at Karnak. Within the sacred precincts of the temple, 
a shrine carrying the golden statue of the god, is hidden from public view until the next year. Symbolically renewed and reborn, the divine King Ramses advances toward the innermost reaches of the temple, where no common mortals are allowed to venture. Begun by his father, Seti I, this awesome hall was completed by Ramses. A soaring forest of stone, it is created of 134 pillars, some of them 80 feet high. Ceilings and columns are ornamented with Ramses' cartouches, magical ropes that surround the king's name to protect him from evil. In the hieroglyphs of his name is the message, it is Ray, the sun god, who bore him. From the sun god, the pharaohs drew their right to rule, their divinity, their legitimacy, and crown. So they constructed this mighty city of God. A hundred things enlarged and embellished it over a period of 2,000 years. A creation that did not cease until the Christian era. That has resumed as modern archaeologists restore this timeless testimony of faith. Across the Nile stretches the land of the dead. Here, in mystical imitation of the setting sun, the bodies of the deceased were laid to rest, that they might rise again as the sun did each day. Cut into the heart of the mountain, the Theban necropolis is a vast labyrinth of tombs. Here, Ramses' architects built his splendid mortuary temple, the Ramoseum. In its forecourt lie huge fragments of his colossal statue, 1,000 tons of granite that once rose 57 feet in height, that inspired Shelley's sonnet, Ozymandias, in which he called the pharaoh, king of kings. Ramses died in 1224 BC. The Ramesseum was magnificent. Here, the magic of his name and images would keep him alive forever. This was but a stopping point for the dead king and his funeral procession. A sacred place where offerings would be made to him from this day throughout all time. provided for, one could live forever. So they carried with them everything the dead might need for the voyage through eternity. For a king, there would be boats in which he could sail endlessly on the Nile. he could continue to reign. Even magical figures would be provided to do his bidding in the afterlife. In their tomb paintings, the people of the Nile depicted the hereafter as a pleasant extension of their earthly lives, a place where they could amuse themselves hunting ducks where rich crops would sustain them. The deceased carried with them books of the dead. They instructed the departed on how to avoid the gods and demons that would attempt to bar their way. Her body painted with stars, a goddess of the sky stretches over a reclining god who represents the earth. Between them, a winged form of the sun god sails through the netherworld.
The divine, ibis-headed scribe Thoth makes notes as the deeds of the deceased are weighed on the scale of justice. In an address to the gods, the departed will assert his innocence. I am pure of mouth and hands, without sin, without guilt, without evil. Those who were judged to be without sin could join Osiris to dwell in the happy land of the setting sun. But most important, there must be a body to which the soul could return. Anubis, god of embalming, prepares the body for the life to come. So Ramses Mummy would have gone to his tomb after a priest pronounced over it, you will live again forever. The tomb of Ramses II. In a state of dangerous disrepair, its access is forbidden to almost everyone. But a team headed by Dr. Kent Weeks of the University of California at Berkeley has recently mapped it. In the dynasty following Ramses, the royal tombs were systematically plundered. As a last resort, priests collected the surviving royal mummies and hid them. In 1871, a grave robber found Ramses II, where he had lain undisturbed for 3,000 years. Reclaimed by the Egyptian government, the mummy of Ramses now reposes in the Cairo Museum, far from the Valley of the Kings. This is the West Valley. It's part of the ancient necropolis of Thebes, about nine square miles of some of the most important archaeological monuments anywhere in the world. Valley of the Queens, Valley of the Kings, Tutankhamun's tomb, they're all here. But in spite of several centuries of interest in this area, there still does not exist a detailed archaeological map of what it contains. That's the purpose of the Berkeley Theban Mapping Project, to make as detailed an archaeological map as modern technology will permit. It's an important project. It's going to make it possible for us to study the history of the necropolis, but even more important, it's going to help us to preserve it and protect it. Surveying techniques are used to measure topographical features. Thank you. At headquarters in a village below the necropolis, the team reviews its findings. Okay. Can you see Q2 there above the temple at Daryl Medina? Aerial photographs are used to plan tomb mapping for the next day in the Valley of the Queens. Right above the temple? Yeah, right there. Okay, that's the first point we'll occupy tomorrow morning. When surface measurements are combined with plans of the tombs, they will create new and revolutionary three-dimensional maps. These will make it easier to find correlations between the geography and the locations of the known tombs, and perhaps enable scientists to find tombs still undiscovered. Let's drop everything here, Dave, and then we can send it on down. Why don't you and Jenny go on down? We'll start passing stuff to you. Dave, why don't you choose what we have to take down and we'll leave the rest up here, right? I'll get the lantern. Not you. <laughs> Let's finish that rear chamber today if we can, Dave. I think the camera felt like 13 feet in the It looks like a steep set of stairs. Yeah, watch your step, people. It is, everybody. I got it. Okay. Good luck with you. Standard surveying techniques are used to obtain the dimensions of each chamber. Every archaeological detail will be drawn and recorded. Uh, 
I think that's about it, Kath, to get those problems in the back chamber. It was customary to place the tombs of royal children in the Valley of the Queens. This is the tomb of the young prince, son of Ramses III. Here, the pharaoh himself offers incense to the gods on the boy's behalf. In these touching scenes, the pharaoh leads his nine-year-old son into the presence of the divinities of the underworld. Carrying the feather of truth, the boy obediently follows his father. It is believed the ancient sculptors and painters lit the interiors of tombs and temples with polished metal reflectors used as mirrors. And these scenes were filmed under the same conditions. This is the tomb of Nefertari. Though Ramses had at least four royal wives, she remained his favorite. Due to humidity caused by increased irrigation in nearby farmland, the exquisite murals of her tomb are flaking off. Unless scientists can halt the deterioration, these may be the last moments of what was imagined as the endless ages in which Nefertari would live on these walls. This was the woman with whom Ramses believed he would go through eternity, to whom these words were written. The princess, rich in grace, lady of affection, sweet with love, mistress of the two lands, songstress of the beautiful countenance, greatest in the harem of the lord of the palace. All that you say will be done for you. Everything beautiful according to your wish. All your words bring contentment to the face, wherefore men love to hear your voice. These tributes speak to us of love and hope, a people and a civilization that soared brilliantly and then was eclipsed. Here at the Temple of Isis, built on an island in the Nile, the religion of ancient Egypt had its last stronghold. After 332 BC, the Greek Ptolemies would reign as the last dynasty of pharaohs. Embracing the Egyptian religion, they built this temple dedicated to the worship of Isis, divine symbol of motherhood, her husband Osiris, and their son Horus. Their stories are told and retold on the temple walls. But the story of another holy family was to sweep over Egypt. The carvings, now considered pagan, were chiseled away. Christianity became the state religion, and in the sixth century, this temple became a Christian church.
the meaning of the hieroglyphs would be forgotten, the ancient rites forbidden. For 12 centuries, the story of Egypt's ancient civilization would be lost. In 640, Islam and the teachings of Muhammad swept over the country. A succession of foreigners was to rule until 1952, when revolution restored full independence to Egypt after 2,000 years. Cairo is the African continent's largest city. Vexed by 20th century problems of explosive growth, pollution, economic and political difficulties, Cairo, like Egypt itself, survives through the resilience, humor, and vigor of its people. Facing an expanding population and an emerging nation's need for energy, the Aswan High Dam was built in the 1960s. With 17 times the material contained in the Great Pyramid, the dam is a monument to the new nationalism and what some would call the 20th century religion, technology. Behind the dam, Nubia was flooded. Much of this ancient land disappeared beneath the rising waters of the Nile. And at Abu Simbel, a magnificent temple hewn from a sandstone monolith, the newly forming lake licked at the feet of these colossal images of Ramses II. A concerned world realized that the temple would soon be engulfed. How could it, and the temple of Nefertari, which flanked it, be saved. At the 11th hour, with funding from Egypt, the United States, and UNESCO, an international team swung into action, racing the rising Nile. Slab by slab, in cuts no more than a quarter of an inch thick, the temple was dismantled. The work continued night and day as workmen cut 190 feet down through the cliff. for storage, the sections made a giant jigsaw puzzle. to the Nile, the temple was reassembled. The precision of watchmakers was applied to the colossi, reconstructed to an accuracy of a tenth of an inch. This temple was designed by ancient priest astronomers so that the sun would penetrate deep within to bless the figure of the Pharaoh on the jubilee that celebrated 30 years of his reign. In our time, engineers have resituated the temple so that the sun still streams in on the Pharaoh on each anniversary of that day, 3,200 years ago.
Gilding the statue of the king seated among the gods, the sun god Ray bathes the figures in sacred light. of ancient Greece and Rome. These works are expressions of the quest for the meaning of life itself, a longing for connection with the gods, a need for beauty, a hope for immortality. They are worth knowing and worth saving because the record of the past tells us something of ourselves and hints of our future. Here, Egyptians and travelers alike raise their eyes to Ramses. Speak of him. Remember him as a leader who signed the world's first major peace treaty. It reads, Beginning with this day, in order to bring about good peace and good brotherhood between us forever, he is in peace with me, and I am in brotherhood with him, and I am in peace with him forever. In the religion of the ancient Egyptians, to speak of the dead, is to make them live again. For Ramses, the quest for eternity has been fulfilled. 